Would you take your Bibles now and turn to the book of Luke, the 23rd chapter. Our message today comes from Luke 23, uh, verses 23, I'm sorry, 32 through 42, 43. Luke 23, verses 32 through 43. We're going to be leaving uh, for a few weeks uh, Matthew, per se. We'll touch back uh, with Matthew, obviously, as we get closer and closer to Holy Week. Uh, we will uh, be looking at uh, more topically oriented things, uh, going to all four Gospels, uh, to make sure that we get a good understanding of what happened in that week. Here now, the Word of God from Luke, the 23rd chapter. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hanged, railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. May the Lord bless this hearing as well as the reading of his holy word. At the cross, there were actions taken and people who were witnesses. Uh, we see this across all four Gospels. Two of these actions were the sign that was posted above the head of Jesus, that's not an unusual practice of the day, and the casting of lots for his clothing, both of which are recorded in our passage today in Luke and elsewhere. But of greater interest to me as I prepared for uh, this message today was the impact of the crucifixion on certain people. After all, the facts are interesting, but the facts are not what Jesus died for. Uh, it's for people that Jesus died. People like us. Uh, his death and resurrection sealed the great plan of God to save for himself a people to worship him into eternity on this earth and in his heaven. That's our purpose. I find it interesting that philosophers are always asking, what are we here for? Well, Christians already know what we're here for. We're here to glorify God and enjoy him forever, to put it in Westminsterian language. That's what we're here for. So we'll briefly look at at least three groups of people and see how they were immediately affected by being there at the cross. As the mother of Jesus, Mary was allowed to be physically closer to Jesus than most as he hung on the cross. John was allowed to accompany her uh, if for the only reason that he was Fairly well known, uh, apparently his family was fairly prominent, but he was also her, quote, escort. He was the one on whose arm she clung as she stood there before her dying son. Let's remember that not, it was not until after the resurrection uh, that, uh, that the half-brothers and sister of Jesus believed in him. They didn't follow him. They did not, I wouldn't have believed my brother either. <laughs> Wait a minute, I have known you too long. The problem with that, of course, is that their misconception of Jesus was based on their own sin, 
not in the sin or fault of Jesus. But they were not believers. And so uh, we find that Mary, of all the members of the family, was the only one that really believed. And we see hints of this at his birth when we find that Mary stored up all these things in her heart and pondered them. And over time, we see Mary's name included more and more and more among those who followed Jesus. And we find uh, that she was in the upper room uh, at Pentecost. And so we find that Mary uh, was uh, well respected, yes, revered, I don't think I'd go that far. Um, but she was well respected. As a matter of fact, it's thought that Mary was the primary source of information for Luke when he came to write the gospel. Uh, because Luke provides information that only Mary would have known. Whereas Matthew also probably did, um, but uh, it could have come from any number of sources. So Mary was a main source in most of the early life of Jesus. But the effect on Mary was that she was a true believer. And so she's standing here uh, and uh, watching her innocent, perfect son crucified. John was a natural choice since, as I said, he came from a, a fairly wealthy, influential family. He was known in Jerusalem and he was also a follower of Jesus, but that didn't matter so much to the Romans. As we will look at the words of Jesus spoken from the cross in a week or so, uh, let's recognize that uh, uh, what happened to these two in particular as a result of the crucifixion. Jesus gave John the responsibility of caring for Mary. Her well-being was now his responsibility because Jesus was dying. Mary was assured of the care that was her due uh, as the mother of Jesus. Jesus was the oldest son. It was his responsibility to take care of the whole family. As a matter of fact, we know that Joseph had already died. We don't know exactly when, but we do know the order of things in Jewish society. That Jesus probably, at an early age, began to work as a carpenter to support the family. So any of us that think, well, Jesus wouldn't know anything about raising teenagers. He does. Because he helped his mother raise his siblings. Uh, and as far as, uh, as the uh, frustration that goes with that, Jesus, well, he had to put up with that too. Uh, Jesus fulfilled, though, his responsibility to his mother by setting up the relationship of care that she would receive in the home of John. Now, John was also, it, it just so happens that uh, John was aware of this kind of thing. Uh, John was the one probably best able to do that. Now, where were uh, Jesus' half-brothers and sister? Well, they were up in Galilee. That's where they lived. But Mary was there at the moment in Jerusalem. We read in Deuteronomy 5 and Exodus 20, following the giving of the Ten Commandments, of the responsibility to honor our parents. In Jewish society, this revealed itself by taking care of them into the grave. And this is exactly what many today do, but many also shirk that duty. They don't see that as a means of honoring mother and father. Uh, but in this, uh, in this particular culture and society, this is exactly how parents were honored. And Jesus perfectly fulfilled that duty, even from the cross. He promises, though, to also take care of us. For those who are uh, His, and have been born again through faith in His finished work on the cross... Let's remember his words in Matthew 7, 9 through 11. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Jesus has promised to take care of us. Well, do we believe him? See, I don't think any of us really call into question the promises of God to take care of us. 
What we have trouble with is our actually believing. So the question that I have is, do you believe that the chair you're sitting in will hold you up? Well, obviously you do, since you're sitting in it. Well, if you say you believe that God will take care of you, have you actually leaned upon him wholly for all of his promises? For those who are not his and have not been born again, I would ask these questions. Have you managed your life? Has it gone well? Have you done a good job? Can you say that you're on top of everything? Or do you feel sometimes like everything's on top of you? Do you think that perhaps Jesus could and would manage your life better than you have? Questions to consider. Let us trust in Him who so faithfully took care of His own mother, even from the cross, to take care of us. He said in Mark 3, verses 33 to 35, Who are my mother and my brothers? See, his mother and his brothers thought he's gone crazy. So they convinced Mary to go to him while he was still in Galilee. And they said, look, uh, we're, uh, we, we, need, we think you ought to take a vacation. It's time for you to take a vacation. You really need to take a vacation. What they didn't say was the men with the white coats were out back. Okay? And so Jesus says, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Wow. See, Jesus has a much larger view of family relations than we do. I have often said, and I'll say it again today, uh, <coughs> when... We pass from this earth, the relationships that we have on this earth will be severed. Is that not true? Isn't that right? Yes. What about the relationships that we share as brothers and sisters in Christ? What about that relationship? How long does that last? Is that going to be severed when we leave this earth? No, it's going to be forever. Hence, Christians, keeping that in mind, ought to always be aware of that relationship and seeking to make sure that we have nothing to apologize to one another for on the streets of heaven when we meet. But God has promised to take care of us, so let's trust that he will do so, even in the most trying of circumstances. Uh, I would agree to a point that Mary suffered when Jesus was on the cross as any mother would suffer when her child is being executed and that wrongly. Let's not give too much credence to it, but understand, even in her distress and his, Jesus took care of her. And even in our distress, Jesus will take care of us. The Roman soldiers were also affected by what happened to Jesus on the cross that day. They mirrored the world in that they divided into two groups. One, the most heavily populated of the two, didn't care at all about Jesus. They even joined the Jews in mocking Jesus. They didn't care. They mocked everybody they hung on a cross. They weren't particularly cruel any more so than anybody else. They just didn't care. They did what they should be expected to do. As they were, uh, as it was with every person condemned to be crucified, they were just as cruel as ever in that they scourged Jesus. And then they made him carry his own cross. By the way, that scourging, because of its severity, was meant to get you about that close to dying. And then carrying the cross was meant to sap your strength even further. Even with the darkness and the earthquake, though, they, we talked about that last week. They didn't believe. They didn't care. They offered Jesus sour wine vinegar to drink. That, by the way, was sort of the, the cheap, uh, as my uncle would call it, the belly wash of the day. It was cheap. It, was, uh, it had a little kick to it. And, uh, you know, you could, uh, you could tolerate that. So they gave him that. He refused to drink it. 
And then they cast lots for his clothing right in front of him. What a what what a an insult to just divide up his clothes and then gamble for who gets to keep them. They mocked him before and during his crucifixion. They just didn't care. The other group had only one member, the centurion. Now I'm going to do some supposing here, so just help me as I read between the lines. He saw the darkness. He experienced the earthquake. He heard the words of Jesus. And he believed. His expression of belief is recorded in Mark 15, 39. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. God had obviously been at work in his heart. Now think about this for a minute. He may have been in the temple since that was where the Roman garrison was headquartered. He may have been uh, somewhere close to the temple and heard the teachings of Jesus. Or he could have been elsewhere and heard the teachings of Jesus. He may not have participated in the mocking uh, as the commanding officer. Quite often that happened. The commanding officer would stay back and it was the, 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 uh, the privates and the corporals that would uh, do all the, the work. He may have. We, we don't know that for sure. But you can suppose that he perhaps did not. Uh, God was at work in his heart to make him tender to the things uh, of the Lord. Uh, you know, this is called the work of regeneration. That's what that is. Uh, in, in the heart, it, the Holy Spirit works to plow the ground, to prepare it for the implanted word... So that it comes forth in belief, in salvation. We see something of this in the Old Testament in Ezekiel 37. If you remember, you probably already know where I'm going with this. As the Spirit of God first brought all the bones together, covered them with sinews and muscles and organs, put skin on them, and then He breathed life into those bones to make a mighty army. You see, the same thing happened to us. And whether you realize it or not, the Holy Spirit continues to do that today. And whether you recognize the work of the Holy Spirit in your own life or not, that's what He does in the life of every believer. He may do it over the course of a whole lifetime, or He may do it in the course of a few minutes. But the Holy Spirit is the one that tenderizes our heart to the things of the Lord. So let's make sure that when we present the gospel, Bob does this all the time in prison and elsewhere, when we present the gospel, we are not called or given the responsibility to save someone. I can't change my own mind, much less the heart of anybody else. Sometimes. I cannot make someone's black heart clean. But Jesus can and where God the Father has chosen for Himself a people, He sends His Holy Spirit to do the, the plowing of the field, the preparation work. This is called the, the work of regeneration. Until it comes to the point where it's time for that new believer to be born. And when the gospel is presented by one of us poor wretched sinners that's been saved by God's grace, and we are the ones that he chooses to present the gospel, that person responds because the Holy Spirit has opened their eyes and given them the ability to see the truth of what we say. It is the work of the Holy Spirit from beginning to end. Now, if you agreed with what I just said, let me tell you why you agree. I said, well, I already know why I agree, Thomas. Why are you telling me? I'm going to tell you why you agree. Because... The Holy Spirit in your heart gives you the understanding of His Word to, under, to, to say, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. If it were not for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our hearts as believers, we would not believe or understand. If it were not for the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of unbelievers, they would never come to salvation. We read in Ephesians 2, 
verses 12 through 13, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. We, talk, uh, we sang this morning about, are you washed in the blood? Well, who washes you in the blood? The Holy Spirit. He takes the blood of Jesus, as it were, applies it to our sin, washes us, clean as we can be, and then by God's grace continues to wash our feet, even as Jesus did his disciples' feet on that, uh, that day, that last night before his crucifixion. This is the effect of the Holy Spirit at work in the hearts of those whom God desires to come to salvation through His Son, Jesus. No one comes to Christ for salvation, no one, unless first the Holy Spirit has worked in their heart to make them tender towards the things of God. There are two things that I would warn our church against, and that is any missionary who comes first and only asking for money. Okay? And I will tell you that we have been blessed with a host of missionaries that have come through and never asked for money. They simply ask for prayer. And what does prayer do but indicate to God that we desire Him to do the work? For we recognize that we cannot do the work. The other thing that I would warn us against is thinking that we do the work. We don't do the work. God does the work in our hearts. So, if you had a desire to open your Bible this week, good. Congratulations, I am thankful. But don't get the big head and think that we're all holy because we've opened our Bibles. We are sinners saved by God's grace, and it is His Holy Spirit that worked in us to make us will and to do of His good pleasure. This is what the Scripture tells us. This is the effect of the Holy Spirit as He works, not only in the hearts of unbelievers to regenerate them and to make them tender towards the things of the Lord, but in the hearts of believers to make us love Him even more. No one comes to Christ for salvation unless first the Holy Spirit makes their heart ready. The questions we must ask ourselves today are these. Has the Holy Spirit worked and made our hearts tender toward the things of God. Did he do so before we came to salvation? Well, the answer to that, if you're saved, is yes. Now, I was saved so long ago, I'm not quite sure I was thinking straight as a seven-year-old. But he nevertheless did the work. Just like he did the work in this centurion's heart. Okay? Just like he did the work in your heart, if you're a believer. Everyone knows about, though, the third group of people at the cross. Uh, again, another example of the Holy Spirit working. The two thieves were there totally against their will. I found that uh, there are many things uh, in the school system that relate to our prison system. They both operate by bells. If you transport them, they're by bus, right? <laughs> Uh, now, uh, and, and the other thing that is common between our prison system, as Bob will attest to, and our schools is uh, that uh, they're full of innocent people. <laughs> Just ask them, and they'll tell you they're innocent. Why? I'm, I'm not in here rightly. I should be out doing what, whatever I want, right? Am I right? That's correct. So they were, they, these two thieves were there entirely against their will. At the beginning of this gruesome process, both mocked Jesus, joining the leaders of the Jews. Uh, Mark 15, 32 says, those who were crucified with him also reviled him. So we know that both reviled Jesus. But once again, we see the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of one of the condemned men. Why only one? Who decided which one the Holy Spirit would work on? I don't know. 
why God only chose one instead of both. Unless it was to point out to generations of believers afterwards that it is God that saves and it is God's will that rules. Once again, though, we see the Holy Spirit at work in the heart of one of those condemned men to soften his consideration of who Jesus was and why he was in the same condemned position as these two thieves. And not only did the Holy Spirit open his eyes to the true nature of Jesus, but the Holy Spirit opened his eyes to his own true nature. Think about this for a minute. Let's listen to what Luke said in Luke 23. We read it earlier. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Now think about that for a minute. Do you hear the repentant attitude in the first thief? No. What you hear is a very selfish railing against Jesus to say, I don't care whether you're the Savior. I don't care if you're who they say. But if you can take yourself off the cross, prove it and take me with you. He was just interested in getting off that cross. But that's not what happened for the second one. See what he said? The other rebuked him saying, Do, not, do you not fear God? Since you and I are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. <clears throat> wow. You see how he embraced the truth? He recognized who Jesus was. He recognized who he was not. He recognized the justness of what God was doing. And the unjustness of Jesus dying on the cross? While the first thief urged Jesus to save himself, uh, save himself and the thieves for a selfish reason, the second re recognized the very rightness of his own death sentence. And then that undeserved nature of the suffering and death of Jesus. Now did he know all about propitiation? Did he know all about substitution? substitutionary atonement and all the other things no i don't think the thief on the cross had two thousand years of theological study to be able to say oh i know all about that stuff and you don't have to know it either or do you because he knew something was different about jesus and that's what it all comes down to perhaps he had seen jesus earlier and noted his lack of any guilt Perhaps it was the Holy Spirit that impressed upon his heart that he had a front row seat to the culmination of God's great redemptive plan for his people. Wow. I would want a front row seat, but not quite like that. In any case, we see the utterance of belief in the very next verses in Luke 23. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. And we'll, we'll look at that again a little later. But the farthest thought from this man's mind at the beginning of the day was his eternal salvation. Think about that. He did not wake up that morning, if he woke up at all, considering where he was going to be after he died. He just wanted to not die. And I don't blame him. Yet God had his eye upon him though every condemned man desires to live god desired this condemned man to live into eternity the holy spirit would work on his heart there on the cross and bring him to faith and repentance in the very one who was crucified next to him it is true that jesus said a few days earlier to martha uh, before he was raised, uh, you know, uh, before he raised her brother Lazarus from the dead, he said this, and we find it recorded in John 11. It says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. And fortunately, it doesn't stop there. He said one more thing. He looked at Martha and he said, do you 
believe this. The thief on the cross believed and was saved into eternity. We will get an opportunity when we get to heaven to, to ask questions of the thief on the cross. Wow. Think about that. The thief on the cross believed and was saved. Thus we hear these gracious words that Jesus gave in response. Today, today, you will be with me in paradise. We'll look at that a little bit more in, uh, in depth later. But understand, Jesus didn't have to do that. But Jesus always done, does that which is in obedience to the Father. The Father had already commanded the Holy Spirit to work in his heart. So that work was not going to go un, uh, unrewarded as it were. And so Jesus graciously said, sure, I'll save you. I'll save you. Jesus can save into eternity those who seek for a lifetime for him. Or those who do not seek him at all. The Holy Spirit does the work as the Father commands. We read the words of Jesus to Nicodemus. In John 3, 7 and 8, he says, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Did you know that the Old Testament name, the Hebrew name for the Spirit, is wind? You know that? Ruah. Jesus knew exactly what he was saying when he said to Nicodemus, uh, it connected the work of the Spirit to the wind. The Holy Spirit is essential to the work of salvation, but he doesn't operate based on our plans. It doesn't matter what our method of evangelism is. It doesn't matter what our plans are for the day. It doesn't matter. He doesn't care that we tick off the box saying that we've shared the gospel with this many people. That's not an indication of our faithfulness to him. What is an indication is our willingness to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. As he has plowed the ground in the people's hearts that we come into contact with, he will give us the words, and when we speak... If someone comes to salvation, we will be blessed because we've been obedient. And someone we will see someone saved. By the way, just out of curiosity, were you there for the birth of your children? Now, mothers, you know that that's sort of a stupid question. <laughs> but men, were you there? Were you awed by the very process of birth? The most helpless feeling I have ever had in my life was trying to console my wife as she was getting ready to give birth to my oldest son. Because there wasn't a doggone thing I could do about it. But the precious, most precious thing I ever held in my life was my children when they were born. I was awed by what God does. You want to feel that again? Be used by God to bring someone to the foot of the cross. And watch the Holy Spirit at work as they come to salvation. And you will walk three inches off the ground. Because you will have witnessed the birth of an eternal soul in the life of a sinner. Who was bound for hell and now they're bound for heaven. The questions I would ask of all of us are these. Has the Holy Spirit worked in your life? Has he brought you to a true understanding of what Jesus has done for you and who you are before him? Have you been born again? <coughs> Jesus said you must be born again. Now we're not trying to go out there and birth babies. Mamas do that. Jesus We'll take care of that. We're just the midwives. But the condition of a believer is that he must be born again. Is the Holy Spirit within you revealing each day more and more the, uh, God's truth in your heart? And applying it in your life. If you do not see the work of God in your heart every day increasingly bringing you to more and more love for Jesus then why not? 
Why not? I think that's an important question to ask. There is really no question that people were eternally affected by being there at the foot of the cross. Lives were forever changed for those who believed. Mary was cared for. The centurion uh, became a believer, I, be I, I believe, on that day. John went on to be the author of five books in the New Testament, as well as the longest living apostle, having a lasting effect on the church. And the thief on the cross is in heaven. But what are the others? The leaders of the Jews, the Roman soldiers, Pilate, the governor, and the other thief. What, what happened to them? Did they just cease to exist? No. If the story about these that we've talked about is true, then the story about these other folks is true as well. If they did not trust in Jesus for their eternal salvation, if they died in their sins as we saw the second thief on the cross do when they broke his legs, if they continued to reject the free gift of salvation by God through His Son, Jesus Christ, then today, they're in hell. They have suffered unimaginable, unimaginable pain and despair ever since. And there they will remain for the rest of eternity. So we are today presented with two very stark choices. There are only two places that any of us will spend eternity. Heaven or hell. Just as, 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 as stark a choice as you can possibly make. It's easy, by the way, to get to hell. Did you know that? It's really easy to get to hell. Let me tell you how to do it. Do Nothing. Don't do anything. Just live your life. If you are born a sinner and you don't do anything about it, then you're going to hell. Not my words, that's the Bible's words. Continue to trust in your own goodness to get you into God's heaven. You can, but keep on trusting and you'll successfully go to hell. But that's not really acceptable to most, is it? Nobody sells tickets to hell because nobody wants to go there. There are plenty of folks that sell false tickets to heaven. We know that. But if going to hell is unacceptable, then simply trust wholly in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But how do I do that? How do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is you turn away from your sin because your sin is what gets you into hell. Okay? Jesus can get you out of hell and into heaven. Acknowledge your need for a Savior, even as a thief on the cross did. Surrender your life to Him as the only person who can ensure your place in God's heaven. There are only two people who can pay for your sins. You are one, and Jesus is the other. And since you and I have fouled up our lives without Jesus and cannot possibly get into God's heaven. There's only one person that you can turn to to get you out of that inevitable place called hell, and that is Jesus. He's promised to send you His Holy Spirit into your heart to help you grow up as a child of God, bound for His heaven, and He has promised to walk with you through this life right into the next. But he won't do that unless first you repent and believe and are born again. So I would urge all of us, consider what the Holy Spirit is doing. The effect of Jesus on the cross didn't just, wasn't just for the people that were there. It's for everybody, even today. There's only name, one name given under heaven <coughs> by which men must be saved. But once we're saved, we must continue to trust Him to help us grow. Let's do that. Let's trust Him today. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father in heaven, thank you for the offer of salvation you make to sinful people. Help us to rightly assess our own lives in the light of eternity. 
Help us to trust wholly in your Son, Jesus, for our salvation. Thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit. We could not understand, nor would we have ever come to salvation if it had not been for the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Give us wisdom that we might follow the leading of your Holy Spirit each day as we seek to faithfully grow up in Christ. Watch over us this week as we are so much in need of your protecting hand, your loving smile, and your merciful forgiveness. By your Spirit, wash our feet. But if there is anyone here that has never given their life to Christ, <coughs> Father, we pray that by your Spirit you would cause them to believe and to repent and to come to salvation, that you might, by your Spirit, wash them completely with the blood of Christ. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who died in our place and in whose name we pray. Amen.